Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to be here today and address this distinguished audience. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to Mr. Ralph Nickel, Vice President of the Council and Director, Mr. Guntram Wolf and his team for organizing this event. Today, we are living at a time when not only natural, but also geopolitical tectonic shifts are taking place all around the world. Deepening geopolitical instability, growing tensions and unpredictability are weakening the world order and international security system, creating even bigger challenges, especially for a country like Armenia with democracy, making us more vulnerable in our complicated region. Dear attendees, we witnessed the first sprouts of today's challenges and the collapse of the European security architecture in our region back in 2020, when Azerbaijan unleashed a war against Nagorno-Karabakh. After the signing of the November 9, 2020 trilateral statement, Azerbaijan not only didn't abandon its bellicose politics and threats, but also carried out new aggression, this time against the sovereign territories of the Republic of Armenia in May 2021, November 2021, and September 2022. During the last aggression on September 13, 14, 2020, Azerbaijan launched a large-scale military attack targeting the military and civilian infrastructure of Armenia using heavy artillery, missile systems, and drones. As a result, the Armenian side had 225 victims, including three civilians. More than 100 square kilometers of the sovereign territory of Armenia were occupied. Today, I wouldn't like to go deep into the details of the aggressions of 2020, 2021, 2022, but it is impossible to ignore the evidences of multiple cases of torture, mutilation of captured or already dead Armenian servicemen, including service women and other atrocity by Azerbaijani military forces. The horrible videos of the Azeri militaries committing ISIS-style war crimes by executing Armenian prisoners of war should be acknowledged and addressed by the international community. Another issue is the engagement of the mercenaries from Syria by Azerbaijan. During the aggression of September 2022, when the external security system of Armenia didn't work, we requested an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council that was held on September 15, 2022. During the meeting, the UN Security Council member states noted that the use of force is totally unacceptable explicitly named the aggressor Azerbaijan, highlighted the importance of adherence to the norms of international humanitarian law, emphasizing also the fact that civilian infrastructure of the territory of Armenia was targeted. An important step toward the escalation of the situation was a quadrilateral, quadrilateral meeting of President Macron President Michel, President Aliyev and me in Prague on October 6, 2020, where an agreement was reached on deploying short-term EU in a monitoring capacity along the international border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. 
when this mission mandate ended on December 19, 2022, at Armenia's request, the EU Council made a decision to deploy a new fully fledged civilian mission on the territory of the Republic of Armenia for a two year period. On behalf of the government of Armenia, I would like to express our gratitude to the EU and its member states, particularly to the government of the Federal Republic of Germany for its support to our request. The mission was launched on the 20th February and I have already met, met the head of the mission, your compatriot with extensive experience in international deployments, Mr. Markus Ritter in Yerevan. The mission shall play a crucial role in ensuring security on the ground and stability in the region, as well as timely and reliable reporting on the current situation to our partners in the European Union and its member states. Dear colleagues, Azerbaijan, since December 12, 2022, in gross violation of the provisions of the trilateral statement of November 9, 2020, has been illegally blocked the Lachin corridor connected Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. The blockade resulted in a humanitarian crisis. 120,000 Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh had been cut off from natural gas, electricity, food, medical, and other vital supplies. Due to a severe, severe shortage of food and other necessary goods, authorities of Nagorno-Karabakh had to take, take desperate measures issued food, food coupons and are rationing certain food, foodstuffs. Population receives only irregular power supplies from local electricity capacities. Universities, schools, and kindergartens were shut down due to which more than 30,000 students and children were deprived of their right to education. On December 20, 2022, upon the request of the Republic of Armenia, an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council was held on the situation caused by blockade of the Lachin Corridor. The overwhelming majority of the UN Security Council members made clear demands to stop the blockade of the corridor by Azerbaijan and to ensure the access of international organizations to Nagorno-Karabakh. Dozens of countries and organizations issued a targeted con condemnation of the blockade of the Lachin Corridor and urged Azerbaijan to end it. The Republic of Armenia has been putting efforts to send a UN and OEC fact-finding mission to Nagorno-Karabakh and Lachin Corridor. Also, the Republic of Armenia filed a request to the International Court of Justice of the United Nations under convention of the elimination of all forms of racial di discrimination to apply provisional measures to unblock the Lachin Corridor. On 2020 of February, early this year, the International Court of Justice issued its order to Azerbaijan to take all measures at its disposal to ensure the unimpeded movement of persons, vehicles, and cargo along the Lachin Corridor in both directions. Unfortunately, up to now, Azerbaijan failed to comply with the decision of, C of the ICJ and the traffic through the Lachin Corridor is still disrupted. Though the natural gas supply is restored, electricity supply to Nagorno-Karabakh having been cut off since 9th January 2023 has not been restored yet. Food supplies are still carried out by coupons and people are deprived of crucial 
medical care. Only Red Cross and Russian peacekeepers are able to deliver limited amount of food and necessary life-saving goods to Nagorno-Karabakh and transport people with healthcare emergency needs to Armenian hospitals. Growing aggressiveness of Azerbaijan toward Nagorno-Karabakh makes clear the intentions, intentions of Azerbaijan to carry out an ethnic cleansing of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Recently, President Aliyev of Azerbaijan declared that Lachin Corridor is open for those Armenians who want to leave Karabakh. That means that Lachin Corridor is closed for those Armenians who, who live in Nagorno-Karabakh. Dear participants, despite, despite the above mentioned, the government of Armenia has shown the political win, will and has been taking decisive, decisive steps to open a new era of peace and stability in South Caucasus and has been engaged constructively in the Armenian-Azerbaijan negotiation. The Armenia-Azerbaijan negotiation process is going on, going on in the following three main tracks. Agreement on the normalization of relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, unblocking of transport communications and economic links in the region and border demarcations and security. Armenia agreed to separate from the Armenia-Azerbaijan process the settlement of Nagorno-Karabakh issue with the logic that the mechanism of discussions between Stepanakert and Baku will be formed. It is essential for Armenia to establish a guarantee mechanism addressing the issues of security and rights of the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, which will have international visibility and involvement. Without going into the details, I would like to mention that the key humanitarian issues such as the return of all the Armenian prisoners of war and the access of international organizations to Nagorno-Karabakh continue to remain unresolved and are the issues of our utmost concern. We strongly condemn the continuous violation of the Geneva Convention of the, on the prisoners of war by Azerbaijan as at least 33 Armenian prisoners have been sentenced to different terms of imprisonment through completely trumped up charges. The refusal of Azerbaijan to repatriate Armenian prisoners of war is another violation by Azerbaijan of point eight of trilateral statement of 9th November of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, Another aspect of our vision of regional peace is the normalization of relations with Turkey. We are ready to fully normalize relations with Turkey, establish diplomatic relations. We hope, for, we hope for full opening of our common border, which was unilaterally closed in the early 90s by Turkey. We have some small but hopeful signs that we are moving forward. Special representative of our countries agreed upon establishing air cargo transportation and opening interstate borders for third country citizens in July, 2022. In January, a ban on direct air cargo transportation between Turkey and Armenia has been lifted, and we have hope for the speedy implementation of the opening of the border for third country citizens. Also, I met President Erdogan in Prague on the margins of the European Political Community Summit in Prague 2022, it was in October, where we discussed the prospect of normalization. 
Armenia reacted rapidly after the recent devastating earthquake in Turkey. I called up President Erdogan with condolences and proposed our support. After that, we sent humanitarian aid and the rescue team to the affected areas. It is very important to state that two convoys of humanitarian aid entered into Turkey through the border bridge, which had been closed for 30 years. Our rescue team returned to Armenia through that bridge as well. Armenian foreign minister visited Turkey, met his counterpart, and reiterated our readiness and willingness to fully normalize relations. Though the last interactions were, of course, of purely humanitarian essence, we, however, would be glad to have the political outcomes. Dear friends, I would like to stress that the European Union is one of our key partners on our democratic reform path. In this context, it is worth to mention that Germany is a major political and economic partner for Armenia, providing development aid and support for our democratic reforms. Continuing the topic of cooperation with European Union, I would like to inform you of a new important format of the Armenia-EU partnership agenda, the political and security dialogue that the e inaugural meeting of which took place in Yerevan last January. The discussion on a wide range of issues, including the overall regional situation and the prospect of deepening our collaboration in certain areas was not only timely, but also considerably enriched our diverse partnership agenda with the European Union. In this context, I would like to stress that the basis for our cooperation with the European Union is democracy. And according to the latest, latest index of the general assessment of Eastern Partnership member states, Armenia topped the democracy and good governments rating table among the Eastern Partnership member countries and is a leader in the following five areas. Fight against corruption, an independent judiciary, opinion and freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association, independent media and democratic rights, elections and political pl pluralism. Despite all the challenges, we do believe that our security architecture cannot be comprehensive without respect for human rights, rule of law and democracy. Democracy is a strategy for us. We will keep up reforms aimed at strengthening the rule of law, consolidating good governance and fighting against corruption, aiming to ensure prosperity for our people. The 2018 democratic velvet revolution followed by 2018 and 2021 SNAP parliamentary elections proves, proved that Armenia's democratic development path is irreversible. In this regard, 2021 parliamentary elections were exceptional. It was first case when election in Armenia served as a tool for overcoming the political crisis. I mean internal political crisis that we had after the 44 days war of 2020. Usually elections sparked political crisis in our country and it was the case from 1994 to 2018. But this page is turned off after the democratic revolution of 2018. And Armenia now is an 
internationally recognized democratic country. However, recent security challenges raise serious questions. The following question, whether democracy can provide security? Whether Armenian democracy is able to provide security? This is the question that rightfully worries the Armenian society today and an issue to be addressed by our government. Thank you for your attention. Good. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister, for um, your speech and uh, the clear exposition of where you stand and where your country currently stands. We now have uh, time for uh, first uh, two comments uh, and reactions uh, to your speech. Um, and then, of course, we want to give you a chance to, again, react to the reactions and also, of course, uh, get our a distinguished audience uh, into the uh, conversation and so uh, um, then uh, really get get your questions um, and remarks uh, to the prime minister i want to start with uh, dr meister um, our expert on the region um, stefan over to you for a first uh, first reactions thank you is it working yeah it's working it's a great pleasure for us to have you here and i think it's really important also that you are in berlin uh, and that there is this interest also from from the german side on the situation uh, in uh, in um, in the south caucasus and especially between um, armenia uh, and azerbaijan i just want to pick up uh, one uh, one i think key word you 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 have said and then i'm just drawing a little bit a broader picture um i think you you it was rather a question about democracy if the democracy is making the country more vulnerable and we know the slogan also from the from the um, uh, from the opposition uh, democracy versus security which i think is really uh, um, it's a wrong uh, approach and i think it is only democracy which makes uh, in my opinion um, uh, armenia stronger and it is the civil society um, which which is the backbone also of um, of the of the very functioning uh, of of the country, so I think um, uh, it, I know it's it's a, a very difficult situation, but uh, but I, I I deeply believe that the democracy and also your re-election uh, after the war shows um, what what the society wants. I just wanted to make this this point um, in the beginning. Um, I just want to draw a little bit the broader picture because I think this is also important to link what you have said and and with the with the with the German um, uh, audience. Um, if we look uh, to the, the current situation in the South Caucasus, uh, we have two main events, two main events which have, which have changed the security and geopolitical balance in the South Caucasus. And this is first of all the 2020 second Nagorno-Karabakh war, and this is second the Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine. I think they really have changed um, the security balance in the region. If we look into the second uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war, um, I think it's one of the most underestimated wars in Europe, which we had in the last 10 years or in the last decade. I think military experts watching very much this war, but I think it is a, it is a crucial war also in shaping not only the situation between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but changing the entire region. And I think this is, this is of crucial importance also for Europe and for, for the European Union in, in terms of security, transit, um, but also in terms of, um, of the order. And this war has also strengthened Russia's role in the region. Then we have the large-scale invasion uh, um, in Ukraine, which has weakened Russia's role because Russia is, is now much more busy in, in Ukraine. Um, and it's shifting its interests. I think that's also important. Russia has a bigger interest uh, engaging with Azerbaijan and with Turkey uh, in circumventing sanctions. And Turkey plays here a key role. Um, and also with, with the North-South Corridor to Iran um, and, um, and the Middle East. And I think that is shaping also or changing the Russian position here. And I think what we see in the South Caucasus is that there is no regional security order in the South Caucasus. Um, and there are no Russian security guarantees anymore. Um, uh, but Russia has really, it's, it's always its own interest. But I think, um, especially for Armenia, this situation it's very, very difficult because it's very vulnerable um, and it is at the moment in a, in a very weak position. 
Um, and I think that's also why it is so important that international actors are coming more in uh, and, and uh, we have an internationalization also um, of, of, the, of the conflict uh, in, 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 in the region. And I think we have to, we have to admit that it is not anymore about um, only about Karabakh, Nagorno Karabakh, but it is also about the sovereignty of the Armenian state. I think this is a, this is a big shift we, we have seen uh, in the last years. And, and we also see that the, the regional order is reshaped and Turkey's role is increasing. Um, uh, I think a positive development with the war in Ukraine or against Ukraine is that for the first time, the EU is playing a much bigger role in regional security, provided a facilitation uh, platform between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan and has, has deployed also now a monitoring mission. I think the prime minister has, has, has mentioned this and I think this has a de-escalating effect. Um, so at the same time, uh, connectivity seems to be the solution for everything. So the new buzzword uh, for, for the South Caucasus um, um, is, uh, is connectivity. Um, but um, I think uh, this needs to be filled with politics and concrete steps. And I think what we see, especially in the case of um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, is a weaponization of infrastructure and corridors. Yeah, the corridorization also of, of, the, of, of politics, the securitization of everything, and I think Lachin um, and also the so-called San um, uh, corridor are examples for this, that, uh, that um, connectivity is not only positive, but it can be also weaponized uh, by, by um, uh, actors. And Armenia does not benefit uh, from these this, this corridors um, at the moment. It makes it more vulnerable. Um, so just to, to sum up here, um, the EU needs to become more than just a facilitator. I think it needs to become a negotiator. It needs to, to take ownership also for peace in the region. Um, it needs to become a peace actor um, and it needs more international presence in, in this region. I think, and I see this, this moment also as an opportunity um, to, um, for peace and for a real agreement. And I think this is also one part of is, is, is a democratic um, uh, elected government in Armenia, which is willing also to make much more compromises uh, than, than, than it was uh, before. And in, in just the last point, I think also the agreement between Ar Armenia and Turkey is really possible now. I think that's, that's, that's really a, another opportunity we can, can see. Um, and, um, and, and, and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic with all this very difficult situation uh, in which the, the region and, and the, this conflict at the moment is. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stefan. And, and please allow me one follow-up question before I, I go to um, uh, our next panelist, which is really about your last point, uh, more engagement of the EU. Um, uh, if you could explain to uh, our domestic audience, um, perhaps in some more detail, uh, what is the interest? What is the interest of Germany and the EU um, in engaging more? Um, is it related to the connectivity aspects, uh, green hydrogen possibly, um, and energy uh, security? Is it related to uh, uh, military and regional stability? Um, how do you how, how would you explain uh, the pitch to be more engaged? Um, to let's say a skeptic, more skeptical domestic audience, because domestic audience are always, as we know, somewhat wary um, in engaging in adventures seemingly far away. Yes, I think it's it's connectivity. It's the growing interest in the middle corridor. Um, uh, yeah, it's the it's the interest also to engaging more with 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 the with the Caspian region uh, and connecting Europe uh, with Asia. I think that's one part. There's the economic part. But I think it is also about uh, the, the role of as the EU as a, as a normative power uh, in supporting also democracy and stability in its region. And if the EU is not able to shape the, the orders which are re-emerging re, re in, in our neighborhood to be really a, 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 a peace actor uh, engaging in the conflicts, it will fail also as a global actor. I think it is, it's for me crucial that, uh, that it's uh, with its agenda also of democratization, um, stability, um, uh, it, it is part of this region, which is, which is also part of Europe. Yeah, and, and um, I think um, 
so the South Caucasus uh, and, and also this conflict, I think, has impact on so many other issues, relations with Turkey, relations with Iran, um, uh, connections towards uh, Asia, relations with Russia, yeah? Um, that um, if we do not, if we are not getting here an actor who is shaping this order, other actors will do it with a different uh, governance concept, with a different concept also of stability and peace. And I think that's not in the interest of the European Union. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. And I just heard that the Prime Minister wants to directly react to that, uh, the, possibly that last point, and then uh, our second panelist. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. You know, uh, it's very important uh, to state that sometimes some words have different meanings in the different regions. So usually in Europe, where we uh, say corridor, we uh, we mean the connectivity, transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in our situation, it isn't the case. Why? Because of the uh, trilateral statement of the ninth. November of 2020, because in that trilateral statement, we have one mention of corridor, and this is Lachin Corridor, which is according to the trilateral statement, should be and, and is out of control of, um, uh, of Azerbaijan. And it was the the uh, the by the agreement of the Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani president signed the trilateral statement. So in the same statement we have an article on connectivity, which is about the regional connectivity, regional economic and uh, and uh, transportation. Etc. Etc. And there is no any provision about the corridor to the territory of Armenia. And it is very important. Azerbaijan and recently very important uh, to state that uh, President Ali of Azerbaijan recently he publicly said that there is no any provision about. Uh, so-called uh, corridor, uh, you mentioned that, but it was Azerbaijan that invented this uh, term after the signing of the uh, after the signing of the trilateral statement. The question is how it is possible unilaterally. Incorporate something in trilateral statement. That's impossible. So, Lachin Corridor is a life route for Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh because there is no any other route for Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh to the you know, to the external world, and that is according to. And it is by the agreement of our uh, Azerbaijani president is out of control of uh, of Azerbaijan. From the other side, we accept it, but we bilaterally, not only Armenia, but Azerbaijan as well, must uh, should open all economic and communication routes, and. There is no any provision that those routes should be out of control of Armenia. We announced many times that that is red line for us. But from the other side, we are ready. And there is no any exaggeration. We want tomorrow. We want tomorrow. We want today evening. Armenia is ready to open all communications, and by the way, in the Brussels, we had a trilateral meeting. It happened in 14 December, and there was concrete agreement that now we agreed trilaterally to restore 
we built the railway uh, to the south of uh, Armenia between Azerbaijan, Armenia, and further it can uh, go to the Turkey, to Iran, to Russia. Uh, it was agreed. It was announced. And there was very important news. And according uh, the agreement include, um, included the agreement that railways should operate under the legislation of those countries through which they pass through. And but unfortunately, after that, one week after that, Azerbaijan refused to sign what was already agreed in presence of the president of the European Council, Charles Michel. So what is the news? Saying Sangezur Corridor, that means to support the territorial claims of Azerbaijan against Armenia. And it is, I would ask you, I would ask you to, uh, to consider this factor that the same word can have different meanings in the different regions, mm. in the different political circumstances. So uh, uh, that was uh, my reaction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Very clear. Um, uh, Silvia Stöber, you wrote um, extensively um, on the region. You're an expert on the region. Um, we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Um, I just would like to give a few comments on aspects you spoke about and uh, just to go a little deeper. Um, the government of Armenia faces enormous challenges at home and on its borders. In the midst of this complex situation, it's a good sign that uh, the normalizations of relation between Armenia and Turkey is progressing gradually. Uh, the start of the cargo flights uh, is possible since uh, the beginning of this year, as uh, Mr. Pashina said. And the next step is the opening of borders, uh, border crossings initially for citizens from third countries. The Armenian aid convoy for the victims of the earthquake in Turkey was beyond the humanitarian gesture an important political signal to the that report reportment is possible. And at best, uh, this reportment could help create a solution for further links in the South Caucasus. Of this, the most difficult is probably the transportation link uh, between the Azerbaijani exclave of Nahichivan across Armenian territory to Azerbaijan, which you spoke about. The interests of Turkey and Iran are also affected here, and Russia insists on the peace agreement of 2020, which provides for Russian checkpoints along those routes. Um, it is thanks to international pressure from all sides that Azerbaijan has so far not been able to use military force to push through the const constructions of this so-called um, Zangezur Corridor, as it is named by Azerbaijan. Sorry, I will only speak about um, transportation links. Um, the deployment of uh, this EU short-term observer mission from October to December to Armenia's border region with Azerbaijan obviously contributed uh, to, um, to help to not to have an, another military aggression at this border. Uh, at least there were no more military clashes on the border area during this period until the end of December. In this respect, there is hope that the now established in long term mission with uh, 100 staff can contribute to a stable situation in this region. Domestically, too, uh, the challenges for the Armenian government are high. After the peaceful transition of power in 2018, led by Mr. Pashinyan, society remained polarized. The former leadership continued to try to assert its interests through the media and the judiciary. However, it did not succeed in getting the population behind it to such an extent that it managed to return to power. 
the challenge remains to establish the judiciary, law enforcement agencies, and others as politically independent uh, institutions to fight corruption and to strengthen the social systems. In this regard, Prime Minister Pashinyan's government has already undertaken some reforms the, upcoming, the, the economic upswing in the past year could help to continue this protest, process. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps you want to react to, um, I saw that you reacted to one point already. Uh, perhaps you can, can do that uh, with the microphone so that um, we have that discussion and then um, uh, I want to invite, of course, our audience to react, um, to ask questions. Um, and um, Stefan and Silvia, if you have still points to add in the course of the conversation, of course, you will. Uh, please, uh, the questions are addressed to all three panelists. Please, Prime Minister. I would like to uh, touch upon the uh, issue of democracy in Armenia. And I would like to stress that there is no any internal threat for democracy in Armenia. And I think the uh, uh, elections of 2021 proved that. And, but from the other side, we have external threat for our democracy. And the continuous escalations and um, aggressive rhetorics, hate speech of Azerbaijan, let's say, is a main threat for Armenian democracy. By the way, it's very important fact to state first time after the 2020 war, Azerbaijan invaded into Armenian sovereign territory in the 12th May of 2021. And it was two days after I resigned as a prime minister, and snap parliamentary elections were underway. So it was constitutional process after the resignation of prime minister. If new prime minister wouldn't elect it, that means it's not parliamentary election. And when we declared we're going to have snap parliamentary elections, two days after that, Azerbaijan invaded into Armenian territory. And this was a, an attempt impact um, on the election results to disrupt, to, uh, to uh, demolish all the democratic achievements of the Republic of Armenia, to try to create a politic situation, not to allow to have elections, to reduce the legitimacy of the government of Armenia. But even in those circumstances, we stayed devoted to democracy. And we have managed to have two democratic elections. And it isn't our assessment. It is the assessment of international community, international observers, and international media. Prime Minister, thank you so much. I, I do want to, um, before I take questions from the audience, I do want to ask you uh, one question um, related um, to uh, Stefan Meister's remarks. Stefan Meister talked quite a bit about the role of Russia and how Russia's role increased um, in the uh, 2020 war um, and um, how Russia lost um, influence perhaps attention scope for the region. How would you characterize at the current juncture the real Russia? You know, uh, uh, the uh, 
situation, uh, security situation in our region became uh, and is becoming more and more complicated because uh, due to uh, um, situation and events, developments around Ukraine, all the international attention is being concentrated on Ukraine. That's why the, during the, uh, the uh, uh, crisis in Ukraine, we have uh, most dangerous uh, crises in Nagorno-Karabakh and in the uh, in the uh, territorial integrity of Armenia. First, in May or tw uh, 2021, Azerbaijan invaded into the territory uh, into the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh into the zone of responsibility of Russian peacekeepers. And after that, uh, we had a major crisis in the September when Azerbaijan started a full-scale ag aggression against Armenia. And there are many factors uh, for that development, uh, but the most important factor that the attention of all the international community is was or is concentrated on Ukraine, and that creates um, more space for instability in our region. Wonderful, thank you. So I, I have a question uh, there, um, the gentleman there, then the question, the lady there in the back, and a third question over there. And we take always three, but we have time to go several rounds, please. And please always um, quickly uh, introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Eckhard Kunz. I had been head of the EU department of the German Federal Foreign Office. And after that, for five years, between 2006, 2011, German ambassador in Ankara, in Turkey, as it is called now in English. And uh, during that time, of course, we were hoping very much there could be a rapprochement between Armenia and Turkey. Yet there was one big stumbling block that was the recognition of genocide during the First World War. Now, I was much impressed by your statement that Armenia is uh, ready to establish diplomatic relations with uh, Turkey. So that seems to be a very big step forward. Second remark on Russia. Um, you, you said also uh, for the uh, food supply for Nagorno-Karabakh, Russian peacekeepers are very important. So do you see a positive role of those peacekeepers? Thank you so much. And I suggest we, we collect uh, two or uh, three questions always. So the second was um, the lady there in the back. Thank you. My name is Alexandra Hildebrand. I am director of the Museum of the Lean Wall at Checkpoint Charlie. My museum, Museum House at Checkpoint Charlie. My question is, do you have the Communist Party in your country still? or not. And uh, if you have Russian in your country and how many, is this min minority, is this majority, e and um, yeah, they speak Russian in your country or speaks your language, how it works. Thank you so much. And uh, the gentleman there, um, yes, and you come after in the same way, please. Good evening, my name is Rolf Schulze. I used to be head of the Southern Caucasus and Central Asia desk of the Foreign Ministry for many years. And Your Excellency, I had the opportunity to visit your country on many occasions, and I have best of memories, and I'm very enthusiastic about the development Armenia is uh, taking in uh, recent years. If I may, I would like to comment very briefly on what Dr. Meister said. 
Yes, it is, of course, true. The European Union must and should play a visible and strong role in a peace process in the Southern Caucasus. It's a neighboring region. It is very important to our own security. But um, let me assure you, um, as far as Germany is concerned, for example, the Southern Caucasus for many, many years already is very much on the foreign policy agenda. It's not a new area. If you look at the archives, there have been multiple or even countless European or German or joint peace initiatives and um, proposals. The European Union over a decade ago, we nominated a high ranking diplomat in Brussels, a special representative for the Southern Caucasus to give uh, only one more example. France, your excellency, you uh, mentioned the important role France is playing. France has a double head as a nation, but also as a European uh, Union member. So um, to sum up very briefly, yes, we must contribute to a peace process, but we are aware of that for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Prime Minister, perhaps you want to react to those three, three questions. And uh, I look at my panelists, you raise your hands when you want to get in. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, for uh, about the Russians in Armenia, uh, we have, of course, a, Rus a Russian minority in our country, but we have not, uh, I'm not sure even uh, if we have, uh, yes, we have registered communist party, but uh, but uh, uh, they aren't uh, they aren't uh, active. Maybe I, I don't want to comment because they uh, they maybe they would react as an oppositional party. That yes, we have, but we have no we have no in the parliament, in the parliament uh, and in any municipality uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember even if they participated in any elections during last, uh, I don't know, five years. Uh, uh, by the way, now, now we have more Russian in our country because uh, uh, many people, especially from the uh, uh, IT sector, they relocated into Armenia and I think it, that's because of uh, because of some uh, technical issues, because usually they uh, they receive uh, they receive salaries from Western companies and, uh, through the uh, Mastercard, Visa card, and international uh, uh, money system. And uh, after the sanctions, maybe they aren't able to receive salaries. So they decided to relocate in Armenia. Maybe they like, uh, uh, like uh, our country. And uh, to be honest, we are glad for their presence because, because it, uh, it, it uh, makes uh, some uh, additional economic activities in our country. And oh, oh, by the way, we had uh, 12, more than uh, more, uh, 12 and half percent of economic growth in 2022. Not totally, but partially it is, uh, it is, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, because of uh, the activities of Russian immigrants. And by the way, I would like uh, to say something uh, not directly connected uh, to your question, but connected with the uh, with the our regional situation, because uh, the uh, representatives of Azerbaijan very frequently now mention that Armenia is um, is uh, mono national, yeah. Monoethnic, monoethnic country, and they represent that as a fact and as a very negative. But I would like to stress that we have places in our parliament for national minorities. We have 
Yazidi and, and that is compulsory. That is compulsory. So that means according to our constitution, national minorities have mandate in our parliament. And now we have a Russian uh, representative, a Syrian representative, Kurds representative, Yazidi, and by the way, Yazidi community is biggest uh, national ethnic minority in our country. And, uh, and I think now we have four, four, uh, four um, uh, places, compulsory places, uh, guaranteed places for national minorities in in our country and i if i'm not mistaken there is no uh, places uh, in the azerbaijani parliament for national minorities there was an, another uh connected with turkey or uh, turkey uh, we to be honest armenia never has any precondition with the with the uh, for for the uh, establishing uh, relations with Turkey, Turkey, never, and it isn't the case now. We have no any precondition. We just uh, we we just think that we are neighbors, and we should have relations and to be honest i'm even not sure uh, that it's right to voice that now but i think the main uh, obstacle for the uh, establishment of the relations between armenia and turkey is position of azerbaijan because Azerbaijan, every time, is urging Turkey not to establish the relations between Armenia. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I, want, I would like you to know the a very important nuances of that process. We are ready today. And in this case also, there is no any exaggeration. Today we are ready to open borders. And by the way, we, we didn't close the border. The border closed only from the uh, side of Tur Turkey. But now we have very, I, I think, very, very uh, important step. As I said, our, our humanitarian aid went to the Turkey, to the, our border. And of course, it was totally our reaction and position was totally um, uh, uh, based on the humanitarian um, uh, approach. But if this uh, decision of sending uh, humanitarian aid to Turkey would have some political results as well, we will be glad for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Stefan, perhaps we take three and then I come because we have a lot of, I see a lot of hands actually now. So, so can you just, so, so the gentleman there uh, was next. Um, I think you were a little bit later and we had Andr Andras and then you, and then afterwards the third round, please. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for giving me, me this floor. Uh, my name is Javid Nesirli. I am the Councillor of the Embassy of Azerbaijan in Berlin. And uh, I have some short remarks uh, with regard to the remarks of Mr. Uh, Prime Minister of Armenia. And I'd like to state that it is very curious 
that Armenia is a, uh, a country which bears full responsibility for unleashing the illegal war of aggression against Azerbaijan, committing systematic and widespread war crimes and other atrocities, disregarding binding United Nations Security Council resolutions, that demanded immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal of the Armenian armed forces from the then occupied territories of Azerbaijan, as well as the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights and the landmark this, in a decision on the case of Chirag Navas versus Armenia in 2015, which appointed responsible for violations of the rights of the Azerbaijani IDPs, speaks now about international law, human rights, and so called aggression from Azerbaijan, by Azerbaijan. And regarding the, uh, regarding the election road, so well, I will, I will question, play. please. Just two minutes. Uh, Regarding... One minute. One minute. Okay. Please. Regarding Lashen Road, uh, under the statement of 10 November 2020, the road cannot be used for military purposes or for trafficking of natural resources and other forms of work that Armenia and its legal entities have been unlawfully exploiting in the territories of Azerbaijan for its own economic growth. Gain. And uh, last and not least, uh, now we have a unique opportunity, unique chance for the both sides, for our both countries to achieve peace finally. And the peace can only be achieved on the basis of mutual recognition of, uh, of territorial integrity, mutual respect and confirmation of absence of any territorial claims against each other. It is paramount important that Armenia renounces all territorial claims and recognizes Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. And my question is if Armenia is uh, uh, ready to recognize our territorial integrity with Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so we had the second uh, question uh, was Andras uh, Raj, a senior fellow at uh, DGRP. Good evening. Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Andras Schwarz, senior fellow here at DGRP, specialist on Russia. Uh, I'd like to have one short question to His Excellency. The 9th of November 2020 ceasefire agreement prescribes that the mandate of the Russian peacekeeping mission is for five years, and the mandate gets extended if none of the sides opposes it. My question is, what happens if Azerbaijan decides not to extend the mandate of the peacekeeping mission? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And the third question here, the gentleman here. Uh, take the microphone. Thank please. you very much. My name is Emin Milli. I'm chairman of Restart Initiative, and I'm from Azerbaijan. Um, my question is this, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, there is always, when uh, you speak at the panel with Mr. Aliyev, or when there is always Azerbaijani and Armenians in the room, or online, there is always negative and this hate speech and um, uh, we as initiative, we bring together Armenian and Azerbaijani experts um, together with Heritage School, uh, also in Berlin and Belize, to discuss very specifically what can Azerbaijan and Armenia gain uh, if this peace agreement will be signed in transport, in trade, in water management, in other very specific areas, in energy, which will affect lives of everyone in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. Um, and during one of these events, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aram Arjanyan, a UN expert from, from Yerevan, uh, actually one of his interviews also to me, he said that if Azerbaijan and Armenia sign this peace agreement, there will be, in, in, let's say, this uh, full diesel which Armenia buys through Europe, through Russia, will come from Azerbaijan, it will affect immensely like the prices uh, in Armenia, and it will also decrease, you know, all other prices in Armenia. For me, it was shocking that nobody talks about it, neither in Armenia nor in Azerbaijan. Like nobody is discussing what this peace can give us. Uh, so my question was, are you discussing this with Aliyev? And why do you think there is always this negative narratives that dominate this media and public space between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that is a rich set of... Yeah. Thank you very much. 
let's uh, to to react uh, to the, uh, uh, the first point of the uh, representative of the uh, uh, consulate of Azerbaijan in a written way, uh, a paragraph. Uh, let me mention that the International Court of Justice recently in 22 February rejected Azerbaijan's requests made in the parallel proceeding which Azerbaijan brought against Armenia regarding the claims of the alleged mine planting. International Court of Justice rejected the claims of Azerbaijan, but Armenia or Nagorno-Karabakh use the latching corridor for military purposes. So I think uh, I don't need to react because International Court of Justice reacted already. As far as the uh, recognition of the territorial integrity bilaterally is concerned, you know, it is already agreed. In the park, during the as a as an outcome of quadrilateral meeting, and there is a provision on that document agreed in uh, in Prague that Azerbaijan and Armenia recognize each other territorial integrity and agree that the delimitation process should pass on the uh, Almaty Declaration of 1991. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the declaration of the establishment of uh, all world of international states. And what says that uh, uh, declaration? That administrative borders between the army, uh, the, between the uh, former Soviet Republic, republics become uh, state borders. And according to the Prague Agreement, the delimitation process should pass on these principles. But if I'm not mistaken, 10 days after that, President Aliyev of Azerbaijan declared that the orientation process of the between Armenia and Azerbaijan would based on the historical maps. What does it mean, historical maps? We have already agreed. We have already agreed that we recognize each other territorial integrity based on that uh, uh, declaration. Moreover, recently, uh, President of Azerbaijan introduced a new initiative called Western Azerbaijan. We don't know what does it mean, but there is no territory. Armenia has no sovereign territory. The old territory of Republic of Armenia is Western Azerbaijan. Parallelly, saying that we are willing to peace, etc., etc., etc. You know, it's we, it's it's very weird situation, and that is the main problem. That is the main problem on our relations. We agreed on, on the 9th November bilateral statement. We, we signed President of Azerbaijan and me and President of Russia, we signed the document. We reached an agreement. It was a very heavy decision for me. 
Armenia. But there is a provision that all prisoners of war, detainees and hostages should be returned to, to or should, or should be rep rep repatriated. Until now, we have 33 prisoners of war. We are now a prisoner, a civilian people, a civilian person who was caged the representative of the charity organization. He was caged in Lachin Corridor by Azerbaijani and, and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And you know for what? Three days before that, he went uh, uh, into live broadcast in Facebook and he said something that uh, family of Azerbaijani president did, didn't like. And that's the old. Now he is, according to the sentence of Azerbaijani, he is a spy, terrorist, mm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, 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 Your Excellency, if I if I can ask you, um, uh, I mean, I see that the conflict um, and the antagonism is still very strong. Um, We've heard yeah. a proposal here yeah. um, uh, to think about a positive agenda. And I was wondering if you can work to that positive agenda and also perhaps give us a sense of what could be a positive agenda from your point of view. Uh, I'm thankful for the uh, issue raised by um, uh, a representative of Azerbaijan, yes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he is. Uh, I think uh, it's an initiative here based in Berlin, if I understood you correctly, and you are originally from Azerbaijan. Yes. Yeah, and in 2018, when I uh, became prime minister of Armenia, I had a call. Uh, I had a call in uh, during my uh, press conference to the uh, social media users of Armenia and Azerbaijan. On the same issue, I asked them not to use that platform for uh, for hate speech, for uh, for aggressive rhetorics, for offensive rhetoric, but try to talk with each with, uh, with each other to understand each other's positions. But unfortunately, my initiative wasn't. Uh, addressed AI, and I totally agree with you that we need to concentrate on the positive future of our mutual regional future, because you know, that's the fact. We, especially three South Caucasus countries, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, they have very strong um, cultural culture uh, cultural similarities. That's the fact. And we need to concentrate and on the pos positive sides. You are right. We are interested. And that's true that maybe Armenia more interested in the opening of regional communications. And that's why Azerbaijan is trying to, uh, let's say, to sell it to Armenia as expensive as it possible. But we are ready. And I, by the way, uh, I, I was criticized in Armenia many. Many people in Armenia consider me pro Azerbaijani. And they criticize me for, for being uh, like 
or Azerbaijani, Pole, yep. uh, Turkish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I totally agree with you that we need to concentrate on positive uh, uh, possibilities of peace and cooperation. And I, the peace agenda is my obligation. Okay. And please, uh, uh, and I would like to have some support from Azerbaijani society as well. Okay, thank you so much. I, I do want to get a, a reaction from our two panelists um, and uh, or, uh, is, is okay for you okay so 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 we we do a final round and then we get uh, in reverse order so that you have the last words so so i have the gentleman there um and uh, these question short questions yes your excellency i'm uh Yazidi from turkey and our nations have always been close friends and supported each other due to the painful history. A lot of Yazidis live also in Armenia. Some of them are also part of the Armenian Defense Forces. I have two questions, uh, Your Excellency. My first is, what has to happen to stop the Azerbaijani aggressions on Karabakh permanently? Maybe you can make three key points. And my second question is, do you think the Western world, especially the USA and Europe do enough to promote a solution in that conflict? And if not, what do you expect concretely from Western world? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so the gentleman here, and then there was, um, I think, a colleague of mine in the back. Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is Sershak. Uh, I am a climate and anti-war activist from Russia. And my question is to Prime Minister, Mr. Pashinyan. And I want to ask you, yeah, for my experience, it's not always uh, effective to have negotiations with dictators. And so do you have a plan B if uh, the blockade of Artsakh continues? Are you discussing any pressure mechanism against Azerbaijani dictator with European colleagues? Do you have any plans on that? Thank you. And if you can pass the mic, yes. My name is <clears throat> sorry. My name is Anastasia Pochman. I work at the GRK. Uh, I, the Prime Minister, I also have a question to you. I have a question about the assessment of your relationship and the participation at the CSTO. Why? Well, because you just recently announced that CSTO will not uh, hold its joint exercises in Armenia this year, and I was wondering how do you now balance with getting a new mission, a CSDP mission from the EU? and participation in the CSTO. How do you see also the changing relationships with the CSTO partners and Russia in this context? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I do want to read the two questions from, uh, from the chat. Um, one is on uh, the role of Iran and, uh, and Israel um, in the Karabakh conflict. So if you can say a word on that. And the last one by Maria Musla, um, I think is quite related to uh, what we already heard here. It's about um, what concrete steps do you want, uh, do you expect, or do you hope to get from the EU and uh, perhaps also the US um, in order to uh, peacefully resolve the conflict? Um, and before I give you the floor, I do want to give uh, Stefan Meister and um, uh, Silvia Stöber the, the chance to, to also react to any point you would want to take up. So, um, um, Sylvia, why don't you, you start, please? Thank you. Uh, when we speak about uh, diplomatic solutions and connectivity in the South Caucasus, there's still one thing missing, and this is uh, um, connections between people. And this is uh, a thing that uh, has not been addressed enough uh, during the last years. And when there was this, uh, this talks uh, in the UCE and so on, uh, but this is really important when, when, when we imagine that one day there will be a train going from one side to the other side, then people will finally meet. And what will happen then? This is the big question. And I have some good experiences. Uh, we did some training with people from all three countries of South Caucasus for journalists. And they were really good experiences. They really want to talk with each other. They really have topics they can talk uh, about. And so. Um, 
if this would start and people came together, that I, I'm optimistic that uh, it could help to find a solution. I just want to react uh, again to this question of uh, Germany's role. Um, I think we all understand that OSCE is um, is not functioning in, anymore as a, as a um, as a uh, multilateral platform for for the for dealing with the conflict. And I think that's why I always argue for we need we and and what we have seen um, after 2022 is uh, after 2020 is a re regionalization of the conflict. And I think it's really important uh, that there is a, again an internationalization of the conflict that the EU is playing this role, and that the member states are supporting also in a, in a, uh, in a, in a big, bigger amount this role. And I agree with you that in the past. Uh, Germany played a role. We, we remember the, the, um, the idea of a stability pact for the South Caucasus, for instance. So there were a lot of initiatives from the German side, and I don't see them anymore at the moment. I don't see this activities, interest, and ownership from the German side, and that's why I'm, I'm raising it. Um, just on peace dialogue and peace building, I think we all understand that after 2020, this was in the crisis. And I, I have good context to a lot of peace builders who were working on Karabakh since since many, many years, and they were deeply frustrated. Um, so I think really this connection with societies, uh, real connection with societies, no closed shops, experts, just meetings, but but really uh, this exchange, I think that needs needs to be somehow reanimated. And I rather believe here also in a new generation. Uh, which 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 might dif think also differently. So I, I see these people in, in in both countries, but I I also understand that, that big politics is not always supportive for it. Prime Minister, please. I I uh, I will try to uh, to concentrate on positive narrative in the final part of our meeting what uh, I expect from international community. Now, first of all, uh, make it clear that any, any provocation in our region, it doesn't matter by Armenia or by Azerbaijan, would meet a very harsh reaction of international community. And it is very important to keep stability. I said, no matter. Uh, by Armenia or Azerbaijan, because now we have uh, um, observers in the region, and now there is no need for European Union to ask, uh, uh, decide who, who, who started. Now you have your own source of uh, information. And in general, I would like to say that uh, our political team, parliamentary majority, took the responsibility, uh, responsibility for peace agenda. And now we have a mandate for peace agenda. And now we are concentrated on addressing, on delivering that mandate. And we need uh, for support for international community, for our, uh, uh, for nations of our region. And we are ready to bear that responsibility until the final comprehensive and lasting peace. And recently I announced in our parliament that in, and in our government that I have full determination to go and sign a peace agreement with Azerbaijan, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be and uh, like a, like a capitulation for Armenia. It should be real lasting peace for our region. And I'm ready to take the responsibility and for, for, for the peace, 
for stability, for regional cooperation, for international cooperation. That is my final conclusion of, of today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you to all of you.